I can't get it out of my mind. I still go up. Should we go up to the top of the Empire State Building? Well, there's nothing up there. But, oh yes, up the top of the Empire State Building. But for many Americans, these high celebrations of corporate power were offensive. They preached the virtues of big money to people queuing at soup kitchens in the streets below. They were a master image of inequality. With the crash, the skyscraper became an emblem of doom, like the temple of a sacrificial cult. Hugh Ferris's drawings turn an imagined New York into a city of prismatic tombs, scary, abstract monuments in a social void. The shift in the image of the skyscraper was highlighted in Fritz Lang's film Metropolis, set in an inhuman cityscape, a dystopia created by hostile technology and based on New York. You feel a chilly touch of this sometimes in real architecture as well, as for instance in a New York newspaper building. The step from the Deco Tower of Joy to the Deco Tomb was taken by Raymond Hood when he came to design the foyer of the Daily News building on 42nd Street in Manhattan. The idea came from the tomb of Napoleon in Paris but instead of the body of a dead emperor at the center, you have this large blue globe of the world slowly rotating in captivity under the all-seeing eye of the press and by implication its readers, all happening underneath that glittering black firmament up there. My God, what nostalgia. Makes you think of the days when Clark Kent was a boy and the newsrooms of America were full of the likes of Jimmy Cagney wearing their hats while belting on their underwoods. The ambitions of the Daily News are etched into the very floor of the foyer. This, we see, is the centre of the world, with its capital cities in orbit around it, held in the field of the media's scrutiny. I am prepared, under my constitutional duty, to recommend the measures that a stricken nation in the midst of a stricken world may require. This nation is asking for action, and action now. After his election in 1932, Franklin Roosevelt set out to save capitalism by instituting a very different form of state intervention, the New Deal, which included massive programs to employ the millions who were out of work. The Works Progress Administration gave employment to struggling writers and artists. It kept painters busy with murals for town halls, railroad stations and post offices, temper, democratic, subject, the work and aspirations of collective America. This produced quite a lot of idealised kitsch, not unlike the public art of Stalinist Russia in the 1930s, but it also kept quite a few good artists alive. Before the Depression, American artists were going to the left bank in Paris and they, they were having this beautiful sort of hedonistic life. And when the money stopped, they all came back. The Depression was so disastrous that many of them left off their berets and shaved off their beards and became workers in the New Deal. And the work got politicalized. I know in my own case, I was politicalized out of my own poverty. I didn't have a dime. So I was very unhappy. I was very bitter. Nobody wanted my work. And I think I was, when I got on the project, for, I was on for a while. It was like some, someone had thrown me a lifesaver. What artists then had that I don't think they've had any time, ancient and present, is that they felt as part of the working class. When uh, the WPA looked upon everybody's unemployed and the artists were unemployed, they were free to be what they wanted to be, painters. And what they were, it was painters who worked who painted the common life. They were the part of the common life. There was the freedom to share thoughts, to share opinion, share people's financial difficulties, and this was freedom. 
freedom to dedicate yourself, free to say, I'm a painter who's a human being, and my fellow human beings are my subjects. That's freedom. Corporations, too, encourage public art. New York's Rockefeller Center is full of it, including this early relief of heroic journalists at work by the Japanese-American sculptor Izumo Noguchi on the Associated Press building. One project caused bitter controversy. The Mexican artist Diego Rivera was approached by John D. Rockefeller with a commission to paint a major mural reconciling capital and labor in this time of red scares and the threat of class war. Rivera was the best public artist then at work in either North or South America and a hero to the artistic left in New York. He was a passionate, if eccentric, Trotskyite, and he endowed this temple of capitalism with a design featuring political demos, cops bashing the workers, and a portrait of Lenin. Lenin was the last straw. Rockefeller fired him and had the whole mural demolished. Artists from the left were outraged. Photographers, too, produced their versions of the worker as hero. In particular, Lewis Hine. These riggers on the high steel are seen as young angels of risk and skill, icons of American work. The greatest monument to such collective effort bridges Nevada and Arizona, the Hoover Dam, finished in 1935. Nobody from Las Vegas to Phoenix would be able to brush his teeth or water his ecologically impertinent lawn without this government project. The dam became a rallying symbol for American self-confidence so bruised and battered by the Great Depression. It asserts the power of technology and it predicts a limitless reign over the forces of nature. This great concrete wall, 726 feet high, taller than the Pyramid of Cheops, that holds back the Colorado River, the stream that had carved out the Grand Canyon itself. It isn't even fixed to the canyon walls. It sits there, held by the pressure of the water behind it, like a leaf over a drain. Can you talk about the elegance of something so big? Absolutely, because its forms are so economical. The curve of the dam face, the polygonal towers, mass and lightness together. Enormous design effort was invested in the project. Naturally, sculpture celebrating the work was incorporated into the work. These winged figures of the Republic, for instance, and a monument to the men who were killed during construction to make the desert bloom. But if the Hoover Dam was America's biggest metaphor of will and skill rising above the Depression, there was one story that the Works Progress Administration left largely untold. It was a story of violent racial oppression and of resistance, that of American blacks in the Deep South and their migration to the cities of the North. The job market for farm work, mainly in cotton, was collapsing in the wake of the mechanical harvester. So they voted with their feet, and by the end of the 1930s, more than a million African Americans had traveled north to the cities looking for a better America. This was the biggest internal migration in American history. It was left to a 23-year-old painter, Jacob Lawrence, to create a sort of visual ballad, the Migration Series, 60 paintings that narrate his people's exodus to the freedom that they hoped for. I was a youngster in 1935, I was 18 years of age, and all of this talk was around me. I would hear my mother and her peers, like their mother and their peers, had told these stories. 
And so it just took on. It was, they told it and, and in the, through the churches and through the schools and through the libraries. So it just took on this kind of uh, a fascination, reading in the newspapers about uh, uh, people being attacked along the way by the authorities. So it could be a very brutal kind of a thing. Uh, uh, and even the people who had been in the North a while was subject to physical abuse, that kind of thing. So this was, uh, it, we were right in, the, in the, the heart of it, right in the midst of it. So all of this went toward influencing my series on the migration. It was just very exciting seeing the, uh, the people move, or, or I imagined that sort of movement from one panel to the next, south, north, south, north. And uh, I, I loved color. We were going through a Great Depression in order to 